Hi, this is Peter Johnson with JP Rifles and Archway Defense. I'm here with Dustin Sanchez of JP Rifles, and we we wanted to come live from the rooftop up here. Um, Dustin, why why are we up here? So uh, early part, we're in, we're still in June. Um, it's about three weeks ago, roughly, that the death of George Floyd um, really went worldwide. Um, it was on a Monday, Tuesday, everybody kind of found out about it. By Friday, the area that I live in, which is here in Minneapolis, is called Uptown, about a mile, two miles outside of downtown, a um, couple miles from a couple of precincts that are now famous because they were on TV so much. Um, but I'm, I'm really close to a lot of the situation that went on. Uh, one of the main streets they hit was Lake Street, and I live just one block south of Lake Street. So in my area, used to be a very, um, not, it, they're not very 2A friendly, and within you know three days, they've now come to a point where they want to be a little bit more 2A friendly because they want to help not only preserve our, our neighborhood, but they also saw some of the violence that was going on firsthand. They, they witnessed Molotov cocktails being thrown. They witnessed people being uh, assaulted. Um, the looting, uh, it, it just got a little crazy. So, Which brings up why you actually called me. Because you called me during, during the riots and um, part of it is you, you lived right here. Right. The other part is we wanted to chat with everybody else about what we're seeing nationally on the, the trend of individuals purchasing firearms for the first time. Millions of NCIC checks happening mm -hmm. every month, setting new records. And then across the country, a lot of people woke up very quickly to the realization that no one's coming to save them when everything falls apart. So that's the, that's the broader reach of why we're here. Yep. But um, let's let's get started on how did this all start? And we'll start with that Monday with the killing of Mr. Floyd happened on uh, Memorial Day. Right. Tuesday, everybody started hearing about it and the initial protests happened. But there was a pretty dramatic shift from the initial protests to what ultimately transpired in Minneapolis and St. Paul and then other cities. Right. From your perspective, what did that Tuesday look like? Tuesday was calm. Um, so my da my youngest daughter, her birthday's on Memorial Day. So we were, we were at the cabin for her birthday. Uh, we came home first thing Tuesday morning and uh, unloaded the car. We just kind of hanging out through the day and around 8.30 at night, um, I wanted to shoot my bow in the backyard. So I just went back there to shoot my bow and all of a sudden you start hearing uh, cars squealing down the road, people yelling, windows breaking, and then you start to hear the sirens of the, the cops coming in. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the uptown area of Minneapolis, this is actually a really nice area of Minneapolis. It is. It's phenomenal restaurants, the chain of lakes is right over here, Lake the Isles, Lake Calhoun, yep. and Lake Harriet. Great bike paths, uh, tons of community, really a healthy area of the city. So how common is it to hear cars squealing up and down doing drag racing basically and it, windows breaking? It, it's not, it, this is a very, so there's a, a lot of older um, people that live here, you know, so it's the older generation, they live here, they've lived here for years. So it's really calm. We do have a couple of bars here that, you know, at, at bar close, they'll get a little rowdy every now and then, but it's been nothing where you're hearing windows breaking, cars squealing down the road, people yelling. Um, so when it happened, I just, I, you know, I, my wife was in the backyard. I gave her my bow and I said, I'm gonna go see what's going on. And I just walked down the road and uh, there was a, there's an Apple store not too far from my house. And then there's a Timberland shoe. So there's like a whole shopping center. The Apple store had been hit where they had thrown when, bricks at it. When you say hit, what do you mean by that? So they had thrown bricks at the windows trying to break into it. Okay. It was like 9.30 at night, they were closed. So that's where the vandalism, you started seeing that late Tuesday night. Uh, Wednesday night, that Wednesday was Wednesday night. night. Yep. Wednesday night at 9.30. So the first store I came across was Apple and they didn't get in, they didn't breach it, but it had some huge, uh, th their windows are different. The windows look like it's bulletproof glass and look like somebody had actually shot at it at a bulletproof glass the way it just kind of, okay. uh, deflected the, the break. But right across the street at Timberland, they had broken out the window and you could see a couple pair of shoes laying out the outside on the sidewalk. Um, so, you know, thought maybe that was it. That was all that was going on. Um, I walked around the rest of the block a little bit, just getting an idea of anything else was going on. Everything seemed calm. I get home and I'm talking to my wife. We're outside and about 1030, it was, uh, it was almost like a parade of cars just started coming in and people were pulling in front of our house, jumping out of the cars, and they were take, take off running. 
and they'd be yelling at other cars as they come by. They'd be like, hey, Uptown, hit Uptown, hit Uptown. And then that's when I think myself and neighbors that were awake at that time realized that some of the stuff that was going on um, you know, around the third precinct, which is, I don't know, maybe four miles from here or so. Yeah, and again, for the people who don't aren't familiar with Minneapolis, Lake Street runs east and west uh, yep. in Minneapolis, just south of the actual downtown metro. And what happens is there's a third precinct is just off of Lake Street where a lot of the initial uh, protests yep. and rioting started. But that's roughly, what, a mile from us? No, third precinct is about four miles from four us. Four miles line the of sight. The fifth precinct, which four. is the, the precinct that covers uptown area, they're about a mile from us. So, and they're off. Of, they're just one block south of Lake Street. So the precincts, the police department is in precincts, and a lot of the initial stuff happened at the fifth and third, pre, third, third precinct specifically. It really started at the third precinct. And then miles down the road, which is where you are with your wife and kids. Yes. Um, in Uptown, that's when you started seeing it on Wednesday. So what did Wednesday night going into Thursday morning look like? Uh, Wednesday night, uh, so they came back, they hit at 1030, and then that's when we started to realize they were coming in waves. So they would describe, hit us. Describe a wave. So what would happen is, um, for instance, one of the waves was where cars would be coming through the neighborhood, and they would have three guys sitting on the trunk, and they would pull up at at the main intersections there, the guys would jump off, they would run to a store, and then that car would go make a huge block, come back, and his trunk was open, and they come running back from a the store, they'd throw the stuff in the trunk, shut the trunk, and then they would jump onto the trunk, and the car would drive off. Okay. And there would be like five or six cars coming through, all following each other, okay. on the south side of the block, and then on the north side of the block, you had the same thing going on. So you're, Wednesday into Thursday, you're seeing an increase in riot and damaged property, yep. obviously. Um, I know you have little kids at home. I do. How did that, how was that conversation between you and your wife on just the stress level? Um, it was, it was pretty stressful. Wednesday night, we had a huge presence of cops. So, um, they would, they would come in the waves. The, you know, the, the looters and rioters would come in and, uh, they would hit the store and then a cop would come in and they'd all scatter. They would all disappear. Like the street would be extremely peaceful while the cops were there. And three minutes after the cops left, they would already be back on. So it was almost like they were, um, they had spotters sitting in the area waiting for the cops to leave. When the cops would leave, it was like they were sending out texts. I've talked to some people, they said if you watch Twitter on uh, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, they were putting out, you know, their little call signs out there on Twitter, which areas they should go hit. Um, so cops would come in, they'd scare them off, they'd leave. Uh, they'd come in, they'd leave. Uh, but it was later on, um, on Thursdays when we actually started seeing more violence coming in, but that was Thursday night. So Wednesday was just rioting and looting, breaking windows out, trying to steal some stuff. They hit the bank. Um, and they, and by hit, did they burn it down or try to loot it? So they tried to loot the bank. Um, I've, I've actually got some vid video, we can throw that in for some B-roll, but they threw a rock, a paver, they picked up a paver, threw it at the window and it came back and almost hit the guy in the head. And I kind of was hoping it would hit the guy in the head. Um, but anyway, so it hit the ground. They tried a little bit more, couldn't get anything done. And then they, they started to leave and somebody actually was able to get in through the front door. And there was like 20 guys just rushed the bank and they went in and they were in there for about 10 minutes. They came out and they were just had bottles of water in their hand because they couldn't get into any of the safes. So they just came out with bottles of water, drinking water, threw it down on the ground and then ran, went right back into, you know, the main block where you have like Apple, Timberland, Sephora, H&M, and uh, a, a couple large, other stores. A yep. large shopping district yep. within yep. Uptown. So was there any communication or how, how was 911? When you called 911 during this time, what did that look like? So Wednesday night you call 911. Um, most of the time they'd be like, we already got a phone call on it. Our guys would be there soon. So so Wednesday night, like I said, I, I saw the police department and I saw SWAT three different times. Okay. Um, SWAT was three different times by themselves and then like the police department guys, those came in three different times themselves. So a total of six different times the cops came down and cleared out the area. And how did that trend, because uh, we everybody around the country watched it in Minneapolis and then in the in their cities, how did that change into Thursday? You said more violence, yeah. what do you mean by that? So come Thursday, you know, more of the neighborhood started to feel, see what happened because they woke up in the morning, walked down there to get their coffee or whatever, and they saw some of the stores had been hit. So everybody's cleaning up, you know, we, everybody puts on their boards. Well, what we started to notice on um, Thursday were trucks with 
trucks and cars with zero license plates on the front or the back and no dealer tab on the back window during the day started making a lot of you know trips around this area so a lot more people were talking about seeing them and it was almost like they were casing us like they were trying to figure out what the neighborhood what the owners of the businesses were doing to try to prevent them come thursday night at nine o'clock it's peaceful 9 30 peaceful 10 o'clock it's still peaceful so we're like oh maybe they're done come 10 30 you, you you hear the first boom 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 like somebody's hitting something so we walked down to the street and looked and um there was a huge crowd outside of the apple store trying to get back into the apple store the apple store was like their their treasure right like if they had a map that had an x on it and they had to hit the apple store um so as we're watching that all of a sudden these two trucks, and I'm talking about like $60,000, $70,000 trucks, like Ford Raptors come, come in, they're lifted, they're decked out, like these people had money. And they came rolling in and they, they parked up on the curb and you see people run and jump in the bed of the truck and they start throwing chains, sledgehammers and crowbars out. So they had been going around the area and knew what they needed to get into certain buildings. Now, how was the police response on Thursday late night? So at at 10 30 the first call from my neighbor went out to the police department and they said okay thank you very much we got that um at 11 30 uh is when we really realized that it was going to be bad was a couple of the residents from this neighborhood went over there and they're videotaping everybody doing their stuff and this guy got extremely pissed off and chased a lady with a baseball bat and somewhere but from the time that he got the baseball bat to her he lost the baseball bat but he was still able to grab her and throw her down to the ground by her throat and started punching her in the face so you're talking about one of the looters right. assaulting one of the local residents yeah yep okay. yep so um you know, just she was just a, a girl. She's about in her twenties, not trying to fight. She was just, you know, like, hey, I can, I can videotape this. This is, you know, I, I'm not sure of all the conversations, but I do know she was like, I can videotape this. I can't stop me. So he attacked her and he threw her down on the ground and was beating her, like punching her in the face, and nobody was doing anything. And that's when my wife and I realized it was going to be a, a bad night. And I actually was in a parking lot and I ran out of the parking lot into the intersection. And it was like this just moment of, so you're over here beating this lady and now you're gonna beg. But you, she, you know, she was begging when you were punching her and you didn't care, but now all of a sudden the, the tide has changed. You know, now you're, now you're the guy that's, that's being scared. Um, so anyways, he, he got done with that. Um, and I, I did kick him in the face uh, just cause like, dude, you're, we're not gonna do that. So kicked him in the face. And I helped the girl up because he and the guy got off and took off running. My wife was standing behind me watching the rest of the crowd and she made sure nobody got came up from behind or did anything. So we got the girl, we got her out of the middle of the street, away from the crowd. And then we called the cops then and they said, OK, yep, uh, we'll see what we can do. So this is Thursday night now that's shifted where the law enforcement is saying, we'll see what we can yep. do. So this is roughly in between 1030 to 1130 is when okay. all this went down. So I think my wife actually called 911 around 1130. So then as the night progressed into Friday, how did that shift for you? So, uh, so from about that time, my nerves were shot at that point, right? Like I'm like just going off of adrenaline, I'm wide awake. And um, some other community people started to come around, but anytime it got really aggressive, they would, they would just disappear. And uh, run back to their own. They would run back to their, their own houses and stuff like okay. that. And as the night progressed, they just got more and more confident that no cops were showing up. So there was one point where the the entire road from intersection to intersection was a parking lot where they were parked up on the curbs. They were parked in the street so nobody could get in or out. Um, and they just kept coming in. And at one point, a uh, U-Haul being led by a car. So it was a car, a U-Haul, and another car behind it. They came driving up. They went up on the curb, drove right past everybody, not really slowing down. They didn't care if they hit anybody, like everybody just needed to get out of their way. And they pulled up to the H&M doors with the U-Haul, opened the doors back right up to their doors and unloaded H&M into their U-Haul, shut it, and then guys got out, like guys were sitting on their window sills with guns in their hand and led the U-Haul out. And the U-Haul was behind it, and then the car behind that one, there were guys on the on the windows uh, too, with guns in their hands as they left the scene. So, and this is the, the important takeaway already is, from Monday to not even Friday, less than five working days, 
your entire community shifted from one that was completely peaceful, really nice area to be in, to literally armed looters so, running through the street. The best way to really explain it for me is to look at it this way, is that my neighbors have called the gang task force unit on me because I'm Mexican and I've walked around with guns, okay? To, that could have been, a, that, they've done that. So that we could say that call could have been on Monday. And come Friday, they were begging me to be out in the block with my guns to keep them safe because they had seen the violence going on. And not just the violence, because we've seen violence, but what I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what shifted a lot of perspective was no one's coming for you. Yes. Yeah, so that really kicked in come Friday. Now let's talk about Friday. Then. So Friday morning, uh, um, I ended up, as things calmed down a little bit, um, you started seeing a different um, demographic of people coming in and they were coming in with their kids and they were just going to get close. They weren't being violent. They were walking by people. They were saying hi and being nice. Um, and this has come around 1 30, in the morning. Um, and then I found out there was a guy. So I, I made my family leave um, after those guys were running around with the guns in the so car. Like Thursday night, Still your this, family. Thursday night, my family left, okay. which... And then it was like right around Friday morning, actually. And thankfully they had a safe place to go in yes. the metro. Perfect. They actually, they went uh, an hour and a half north of okay. the city. So we, we just got them out of here. Um, so I stayed back and uh, around three o'clock, I heard there was a guy that had went to a local bookstore and sat down in front of the bookstore by himself to plead with people not to, to destroy that place. So when I found out about that and we still hadn't seen one cop come through, I walked down and I sat with him. Um, and I actually had, I, I went down, I had two guns on me now and I went and sat down and when I stayed with him till like 5.30, it was, it was actually about seven in the morning, but it was at 5.30 a.m. was the first time a cop came down our neighborhood. And that would be Friday early morning. Friday early morning. So call, first call came in around 10.30 and we didn't see them until 5.30 a.m. And they didn't stop. They came down the road, they hit their lights, no sirens, they just hit their lights, everybody scrambled. Then when they, they saw no more cops were coming in, they came back and started hitting the store, hitting all the places again. So they literally were hitting uh, some of the stores. They hit the AT&T store at 7.30 a.m. Friday morning and no cops. Yeah. So come Friday, you know, all the other stores now, everybody's boarding up, everybody's putting things up. And come uh, Friday night, um, you could tell a lot of the guys on the neighborhood, their uh, and neighbors, everybody there, they were just, their nerves were shot. And that's when we started finding out, finding bottles, like bottles with fuel in them and Molotov cocktails. So they had bottles, they had the lid on it and they had uh, like a towel or something wrapped around it sitting in our alleys. So Pre-position. Pre-position, yep. Okay. So we started finding them in our alleys. And so what was happening during all the, while this was happening in Uptown, where you live, the rest of Lake Street was literally on fire. Yes. I mean, not, not figuratively, like, it was literally like, on fire. Like four to five miles were on fire. I mean, yeah. you look at the third precinct and they burned that entire neighborhood down in like 24 hours. You know, it started with an auto zone and then it moved on to the Target, to the Cub, to the liquor store, to the post office, to their uh, new uh, housing unit they were putting in. I mean, that place wasn't even finished yet. It was yeah, still it was brand new. Brand new under construction. Yep. So that area, a couple blocks of that was completely destroyed or completely looted or both, right? Right. And then it slowly worked its way or it started to work its way down down lake for the most part the right destruction. so come friday when we start seeing and finding all of this stuff and we're already watching um the third pre the area of the third precinct so like roughly four miles away we start seeing that there you know that area is burning um you know a lot of the neighbors here started getting scared and that's when everybody started to meet everybody really like that's when america in some of these neighborhoods became like it used to be where everybody knew everybody on the block and, and by and meeting knew. each other you're talking about your actual neighbors physically going out and talking to each yeah. other again yep yeah. and trying to figure out how to slow the process down and why do you think they needed to do that they're scared um they they love the community like we love where we live um, and I saw some news company saying we're burning down our own community. And I'm like, my kids live here. My kids grow up. There's so many things here that we love. 
why are we? Why do you think we're burning down our own our own community? It, it's none of us were over here burning down our community, you know. So, um, so there was a lot of that where they were like, we don't want that to happen here. So everybody started. That's roughly the time you start hearing like pre-positioned, um, you know, flammables and stuff like that. So everybody started walking the alleys and doing everything, and we were finding them. Being proactive about looking for those yeah. those arson tools around yeah. your community. And then, you know, from there, everybody just became that point where they're like, we need guns. We need guns to protect our block. Now, that, that brings up an interesting point. Um, we went from Monday to Friday. And for any of you paying attention, you'll know that there nationally there was a pretty big shift. Because by Friday, this has started to happen in other major metropolitan yep. areas around the country. Yeah. But meanwhile, the n- number of first-time firearm purchasers were going up. Yep. And a lot of that self-realization that you saw with your own neighbors who might not have been pro-Second Amendment or even, not even, let's not even get into pro-Second Amendment, just pro-self-defense with a firearm. Right, yeah. It shifted in under a week. So, oh, 100, it was, it was even on, I mean, it was three days that it shifted to where they're literally asking me for guns. And I'm like, ah, sorry, I can't do that. Because like, the laws don't allow Yeah, me yeah, the, it's against the law for me to do yeah. that, right? And they're like, all I have is a baseball bat. How am I supposed to stop somebody if they throw a Molotov cocktail at me? And I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to help you there. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I don't know what to tell you because I need to make sure my house is safe. Yeah. But I'm also worried about the rest of the community. Um, and we have some people that do live on my block that don't have transportation. They rely on public transportation. Um, and some of them just can't walk very well, right? So they can't get away. So... Part of my fear was what's going to happen to these people if they can't get out. Um, and, and, you know, there's just some other disabilities going on that you start to worry more about your neighbors as well. Like I knew if, if things really hit, like grab my go bag with my rifle and I'm just going to hit the alleys and be in the shadows moving out of here if I had to. Yeah, just get right. out of Dodge. Right. And that's actually really why we wanted to sit down and talk today because, correct me if I'm wrong, but you weren't prior SWAT or law enforcement or military, right? Right. So you didn't come from the tactical background to be in literally a war zone overnight. Yeah. You're you're a competitive three gunner and obviously proficient 2A. But for the average person at home, and that's why we really want to get your story out there, is there's some stuff that you can do before this happens. Heaven forbid it happens again. And unfortunately, history does repeat itself. So we want to talk about what what does that look like and how can we put ourselves in a better position? Yep. And I think, uh, you know, what really drove some of that home for people were when Friday night came and they started to hit our area again and we called the cops, literally the 911, um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, operator. Operator yeah. told me we were on our own. Literally her words so, to me were, you were on your own. Say that again. You call 911 and so, I'm the operator? Yep. So I called, I called you at 930 roughly. And you just asked what my crossroads were, crossroads were. I told you, you asked what was going on. I told you we had people already throwing Molotov cocktails and you told me I'm on my own. You're on your own. You're on your own. And if there's anything that would make you at least want to pay attention to the next couple series we're going to do, it's you're on your own. Yeah. I mean, I li- and I asked her, I said, wait, 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 before you hang up, I'm on my own. So if I have to use my firearm, she goes, you'll have to talk to your lawyer about that. And I'm like, Okay, so now I know where we're at with the Minnesota laws. Um, I've got a good idea of where we're at and what's going on and how the rest of the night was going to to progress. But Friday night was actually the worst night uh, because the community still hadn't came together 100 percent yet um, to where we had one of our neighbors. uh, I'm not sure exactly where he lives, but he's in the community, was drunk. And when they started coming in, he walked out into the middle of an alley with a little 38 special, held it up in the air and said he was going to kill everybody. Um, shortly after that, a black car came in, pulled into that exact same parking lot, and four guys got out with AKs and said they were going to kill anybody that tried to protect that block. And at that time, I still only had my pistol on me. And I was like, okay, we're going to shift plans here. We're going to put on my plate carrier that I had for the tactical games, which was an actual plate carrier, right? Because I'm like, I'm going to buy a plate carrier. Let's make sure it's a legit one. Right. Um, So it was like, we're going to put on a plate carrier. We're going to keep the pistol, but we're also going to grab the AR as well. Um, But we had still did not have control on Friday night of the block. Uh, They were still, the neighbor, they were still running around. Um, 
some tires uh, may have been slashed to keep them from coming back or to be able to leave. So they and we were seeing that tactic actually. State Trooper, their SWAT team was using yeah. that tactic to stop uh, vehicles from being able to drive into the crowds or into the law enforcement riot right. team. So before it ever came out that law enforcement was doing that, there were people of the community doing that because they kept seeing the same cars coming through, or they would see somebody pull in to their block, get out. They'd lock their car, they'd go run, steal something from a store, come back and lock their car, throw it in the trunk, shut the trunk, lock their car, and run back for more. So you're physically watching, or neighbors are physically watching people go loot, come back, loot, come yeah, back. Yeah. And after a couple of days of this, um, I, yeah. some people in the neighborhood maybe took it up on themselves. Yes. As 911 operators said, you're on your own. Right, right. So their cars would make it maybe half a block, and they'd abandon their car with all their loot in it. And then the next morning we call 311 and they would come pick up the car. And, and 311, would... that's a local tow service, correct? Yeah, so it was like, uh, so what they were doing here, because there was so much stuff going on, they are trying to limit the amount of calls that went to 911. Um, they wanted those to be like super serious calls. So if it came down to uh, a car that was just abandoned, you could call 911, but they were trying to get people to call 311 or 311, uh, because then they would actually send a tow truck out and they'd pick up the car. So um, you would see neighbors during the day, there would be a car that already had two slash tires. They would slash the other side of the car, other tires as well. And then the tow truck would come pick up the car and they would actually carry it out of here. And a lot of the cars had zero license plates on them. You could see all the stuff that they had looted from the store was in the back seat. Um, some people actually popped the trunk to look in there because the doors were wide open. Uh, the windows were open, they were unlocked, and you pop the trunk and you would see stuff from, you know, like an AT&T or, you know, the Apple store or, or whatever stores they had hit. You would see the loot in there. So, the, you know, at that point, the people were like, well, this is not, this car doesn't belong here. It's probably stolen anyways. And so they would just go finish slashing all four tires and then they would call the tow truck and they would take them out of here. So to recap that first week, if you could describe it in one word, what would that word be for you? I mean, you're there with your wife and your kids, you're in your neighborhood, in the, one of the nicer areas of Minneapolis. Yeah. How would you describe that one week if you could throw it into one word? Hell. Hell. Yeah. So when we're discussing hell, what, what has happened, what can happen, and unfortunately history repeats itself, let's talk about what you can do, heaven forbid, you're faced with your own hell in your own community. So stay tuned for the next series.